What is the most important thing people can do to make a difference in the world? The most important thing. Paul Bourne, who is a global leader on issues of place and community, says that he has been asked this question hundreds of times in the past several decades. His answer to this recurring question, what is the most important thing people can do to make a difference in the world, is this. Bring chicken soup to your neighbor. And when he answers like that, the typical response is a wide-eyed, really? Born responds like this, yes. The answer is simple, but the act of bringing soup, well, that takes work. Think about it. Think about your neighbors. Taking soup requires, first of all, that you know your neighbor, and it requires that you know your neighbor is not vegetarian, and that they like soup. And it requires that you know your neighbor well enough so that you communicate regularly enough to know whether they are sick. And then, with all the other things you have to do, you have to make the act of delivering soup a priority. And you must have enough of a relationship with your neighbor to know what they prefer when they're sick. Is it chicken soup, or pimento cheese, or a milkshake? So you see, the work begins long before you actually take the soup. Delivering soup to a neighbor is a simple and significant way to make a difference. Deepening community. For the next several months, Matt and I will be preaching about the Christian community and how it is that we might deepen our life together. It seems that summer so separates us that many of us come back on a Sunday like this feeling almost as if we are strangers. And we notice when we come into the building, especially if you have been through the pit stop, the building itself is in the midst of change. And we notice that many of the people sitting around us are different. Some who we are accustomed to seeing are missing, and others have appeared, maybe for the first time or again. And so we're left wondering things like, what happened to the person who used to sit right there? Or why has that name been on our prayer list for so long? Ongoing conversations about life in community give us an opportunity to deepen our relationship with each other and with this body of Christ. Perhaps if we fully engage in this community conversation, we will be more effective bearers of chicken soup. As a beginning point, I think it is important and appropriate to remind ourselves that community is a gift. We do not create community. We live into the community which God has given us. The core identity of the church is its confession that we are a people chosen by God, given life through Jesus Christ, and su sustained and strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit. At its heart, the biblical story from beginning to end is the story of God's people and of God 
who seeks to be in community with them. From the time of creation, God has entered into relationship with the created order, and he has done that by establishing covenants. There was the covenant with Noah, in which God promised never again to destroy the whole earth with water. And the covenant with Abraham and Sarah, the covenant that God made with the people of Israel when Moses received the commandments on Mount Sinai. And there was the covenant God made with David in which he promised a coming Messiah. And ultimately, the covenant God made in Jesus Christ. That new covenant, as Jesus referred to himself, signs the new way God will relate to humanity for all eternity. Community is a gift of God. It is a gift of the God who chooses relationship with creation. Now, the earliest people of God express their commitment to the covenant-keeping God of Israel with the words that Matt just read. We know them as the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Now this confession is so familiar to us, it seems a common thing, but it was radical in a time when most people believed in many gods, in a time when allegiance to any god was fleeting and largely dependent upon whether the god in question performed according to the needs or wants of the people. But the Israelite people stood there and pledged their wholehearted commitment to the one God. We are, the Church of Jesus Christ is, God's covenant people. That is, we are a community created by God, a community given life by Jesus Christ, a community sustained and strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Trinitarian God is at the heart of our life together. Like our Israelite forebearers, we worship one God. And yet, we have come to know that one God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We remind ourselves of the triune God every Sunday when we sing the Gloria Patri, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. And when we baptize our children in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are reminded that our God exists in relationship. And this trinity points us to the relational nature of our life together. Reformed theologian Donald McKim says, The three persons of the Trinity relate to each other in divine love. They relate in the mutual indwelling of divine love. And since the God we relate to, the God we worship, relates to each other and to itself in love, so our life together should be characterized by love. If we affirm, as Scripture does, that God is love, then we are bound to love one another. The love we emulate in our community is the love of the Trinitarian God that calls us into community, that gives us our life together. That love is patient and kind. It is a love that seeks the best for both stranger and friend. It is a love that speaks truth to power and pursues justice. And it is a love that makes a difference by sharing chicken soup. 
When I read the few verses from 2 Corinthians a few minutes ago, I feared that upon hearing this Trinitarian benediction, you might think the service was almost over and start to gather your things and walk out. For you hear these words most often as the final words of worship. Paul uses them for the first time at the conclusion of this letter, and their use in this letter, particularly in this place, is significant. Paul spent several years with the Corinthian congregation, returning there at least twice after his initial visit with them, and he corresponded with these friends on at least five different occasions. But in second... Corinthians, which we seem not to know as well as we do 1 Corinthians, we find that the final four chapters of 2 Corinthians are a terse and combative communication. They are words to a church that has begun to oppose Paul. It seems that what he calls super apostles have arisen in the Corinthian church, They are calling into question much of what Paul has said and done. And then you know what happens. Factions arise. The body of Christ is divided in many ways. People are at odds with one another. It is, at best, a broken community. At the end of this letter, a deeply distraught Apostle Paul offers several practical pieces of advice to that conflicted church. Put things in order. Sounds rather Presbyterian, doesn't it? Listen to my appeal, agree with one another, live in peace, greet one another with a holy kiss. And then in this Trinitarian benediction, Paul offers great hope to the church at Corinth and to the church of today the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. These words point to the relational nature of God and remind us of the ground and being of our own relationships in the church. Community is God's gift to us. New Testament professor Beverly Gaventa asserts that the relationship between Christian people is based on God's action in Jesus Christ. Listen to that again. The relationship between Christian people, that's us, is based directly on God's action in Jesus Christ. And she goes on to say that believers do not belong to themselves and that to be faithful, the relationships among believers must reflect the one to whom they belong. There is no question, my friends, we are separated by many things. We live in different neighborhoods, even different towns. We vote for different candidates. We worry about different things. We each have different passions. Family configurations vary dramatically. We have come from north and south and from east and west. And perhaps most divisive of all, some of us prefer e-readers and others of us read books only. But hear this. We are bound together in Christ. This is the community of God's people, and we do not belong to ourselves. We belong to Christ, and we are committed to this community. We need each other. An anthropologist studying the habits and customs of an African tribe found himself surrounded by children on most days. So he decided to play a little game with them. He managed to get candy. Sound familiar to anyone? Managed to get candy from the nearest town and put it all in a decorated basket at the foot 
of a tree. Then he called the children and suggested they play the game. When the anthropologist said, now, the children had to run to the tree, and the first one to get there could have all of the candy for himself or herself. So the children all lined up, waiting for the signal. When the anthropologist said, now, all the children took each other by the hand and ran towards the tree. They all arrived at the same time, divided up the candy, sat down, and began to munch happily together. The American anthropologist went over to them and asked why in the world they had all run together when any one of them could have had the candy all to themselves. The children replied, Ubuntu, Ubuntu. How could any of us be happy if all the others were sad? Ubuntu is an African philosophy that can be summed up as this. I am what I am because of who we all are. Community, the gift of a relational God. We are who we are because of, all, of who we all are together in Christ. As we move through this fall and consider some of the practices, some of the habits that will permit us to deepen the life of our community, I ask you to commit yourselves to some of the practices we discuss. For now, I ask you to look around, not rudely, don't move your head, just look around. <laughs> Identify someone, just one person, whose name you do not know. Reach out to that person. Invite them to know you. Share your story. Begin the work that will allow you to make a difference later with chicken soup. A relational God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are who we are because of who we all are together. God's gift to us. Amen.